Alrighty. So, uh, for our listeners who have in the past heard sounds of music in the background, we were very confused by that. And then we discovered that where the place we're recording, Zuber International Studios, is right next to a big old radio tower. And apparently our microphone was picking up interference from that without us actually hearing anything. We discovered this the hard way when uh, in several places in this episode, the music came through really loud and it's kind of hard to make out what we're saying. So we are re-recording at just a few little spots where the music was bad. And after this, this won't be a problem anymore. Welcome to the Daily Conspiracy. My name is Katrina Stanton. I'm Ineash Brodsky. And I am Steven Zuber. Today, we are going to be talking about game theory, because we realize that we have been referencing it in earlier episodes, and we probably will in future episodes, and some people might not be that familiar with it. Also, you live it. Yes. We live it. It determines all of our decisions. Can you expand on that? What's game theory? Okay. I'm not as good at the transition. You can tell my transition <laughs> sounds much more forced than Katrina's. <laughs> so I have a def I, I like a definition that I like is treating situations as if they were games with preset rules and win conditions, and the various agents in them are players that have to stick with these rules, and trying to maximize the outcomes. And each player tries to maximize their own outcome, and then figuring out via those interactions what is the most likely thing that is going to happen. Okay, it'll become more clear as we continue to talk about it. Can I pop another definition in there? Please. Because to prepare for this episode, I read the sequences on game theory by Yvane. Ah, yes. What is what is that person's it's name? Scott Alexander. It is Scott Alexander. So same same person, but this is on Less Wrong, and we'll have a link up to it. it. Says game theory is the study of how rational actors interact to pursue incentives. It starts with the same questionable premises as economics. <laughs> That everyone behaves rationally, that everyone is purely self-interested, and that desires can be exactly quantified. Now, of course, like um, like any theory, a lot of it is playing with those presuppositions and changing them and, and watching how the results change as a, as a result of that. Yeah. Another quote from Scott Alexander on uh, Less Wrong uh, from his Game Theory sequence. I'm not sure which post. I didn't save them. Some of the examples in Game Theory won't work in reality, some of the examples that we give to illustrate game theory, they're more of a reducto ad absurdum of the so-called homo economicus, who acts free from any feelings of altruism or trust. <laughs> Which I think someone said that that was the main critique of, of game theory and I guess uh, other economic theories that involve people, which is that it treats them like quote-unquote rational psychopaths. Yeah. So. Yes, but again, just like any other theory, um, you, you make it certain assumptions and you figure out what the result will be given those assumptions. And then you kind of figure out why the result's different. And, and that tells you important things about human nature, about um, evolutionary psychology, that kind of stuff. And I like the fact that the name game draws attention to that fact, at least in my opinion. It, it you know points out that, yes, these are games that we're setting up. This is not necessarily how people act in real life. I just like the word homo economicus. Right. Homo economicus. <laughs> <laughs> the behavioral economic subject. That's right. Really, really, I think that is the scientific term for the straw Vulcan. Ooh, nice. Nice. Let's write that down somewhere. Well, we have it in the podcast. <laughs> it's saved forever. Inyash shows it. <laughs> <laughs> so do we want to quickly go into the most famous game theory game? Prisoner's Dilemma? Uh-huh. Yes. All righty. That's my jam. All right. So, Stephen, I heard you and Katrina broke into a warehouse yesterday. <laughs> That's why I arrested both of you and have you in my prison cell now. No, and we're separated. You and we're are also separated. Purely selfish and rational people. <laughs> I should certainly hope so, because this whole example <laughs> fails if you aren't. <laughs> so you guys have broken into a warehouse, and mm -hmm. I can tell that you've done it because there is glass DNA all over both of you. Glass DNA. In mm -hmm. this world, glass has DNA. I see. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we overlooked something. <laughs> So you are both going to get a year in prison for this breaking of a window thing, because we do not tolerate window breaking in our world. If it's got DNA, it's obviously, you know, alive and self-aware, so you just can't go around breaking <gasps> Ooh, glass. Yeah. Yeah. But I've separated each of you. Steven, you're not here right now. Hey, Katrina. Mm-hmm. Hey. Year in prison sounds pretty shitty, doesn't it? Oh, it sounds terrible. I don't want to do it. No. Well, while we were searching the warehouse, we found someone left an upper decker in one of the toilets. <laughs> and <laughs> And that comes with a 10-year prison term. <laughs> oh, God. 
I, uh, I'm willing. I'm willing to cut you a deal. Because we can't really prove whose who's upper decker it is. Um, do people have DNA in this world? <laughs> Not in their poop. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are all made out of a non-DNA material. Oh. So, unfortunately, the only way I can figure out who this is is by getting you to confess. If uh -huh. you confess that, uh, that you guys were in there and you, you got kind of drunk and then Stephen left an upper decker, we'll throw the book at him. We'll give him ten years. But you get off scot-free. No jail time for you at all. Hmm. Now, because I'm a terrible cop, uh -huh. I'm also going to tell you that uh, <laughs> I'm going to give Stephen this same, this same deal. And if Stephen turns on you before you turn on him, then you get the ten years in jail and he walks away free. But because I'm the worst cop, I'm going to let you know that if both of you squeal on each other... The, the jury is just going to be like, ah, fuck it. These guys are both assholes. Give them six years in jail each. So both of you will get six years in jail if both of you squeal. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That is the basic prisoner's dilemma. Well, my initial impulse is I want to roll on Katrina. Yeah, I'll get okay. scot-free and she gets to go to prison for ten years. He's not talking to you. No. <laughs> oh, right. I'm, I'm out of the room. <laughs> well, right now you are, Oops. yeah. <laughs> well, we are both <laughs> making this decision at the same time, so that's, that's, I was just giving you a hard time, Steven. No, you're good. That's what I was trying to emphasize, was that we are, we are both aware of the deal, and the clock's ticking for both of us. We have to make this decision. Yeah. So. so in game theory, if both of you decide to keep your mouths shut and take one year of jail time each, that's called cooperating, because you are cooperating with each other. Mm -hmm. If one of you squeals on the other one, that's called defecting, mm -hmm. because you have defected on the, on the deal where you don't talk. And, you know, if both of you talk, then you both have defected. So the question is, for each individual prisoner, what is their dominant strategy? What strategy gets them the least jail time? Yeah, well, so for a rational actor, yeah. for a single iteration... Yeah. Let's, let's say you're thinking this through right now. Oh. Let's say Stephen cooperates. What are your two options if Stephen cooperates? So if Stephen cooperates, then I should definitely defect because then I get zero jail time. Yes. And what um, if you cooperate? Though? And I don't care about Stephen in this situation. Yeah. Um, so what if Stephen defects? Well, then I should definitely also defect because then I'll get less jail time than I would if I cooperated. Yeah, because if you cooperated and he defected, you would get ten years. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Okay. And Stephen. Is your mind in the same place on this? Yeah, you've laid out all the, all the options pretty well. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate you guiding me through this, officer. This, you're, you're, you're guiding my decision process really well. Awesome. <laughs> Getting both of you six years in jail. And that is the that is the fun part about the prisoner's dilemma, is that looking at the payoff grid from an objective point of view, you can tell that both people cooperating gets them the least amount of jail time. They both get one year. Steven... I can't believe that you pooped in the upper part of the toilet. Katrina, that was you, and we know it. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the book at them both! <laughs> Wait, no, 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 when you both do it. Ah, fuck it, send them off to jail for six years. <laughs> we got no time to sort this out, but we know one of them did it, they both confessed. <laughs> That's right, there's no other evidence in this situation. <laughs> Nothing else to consider. Nope. Um, yeah, so that's that's one situation, right? The, yeah. the rational the rational result is that both defect and both get six years. See, and that is a an example of Nash equilibrium. Yes, which we're probably going to be using that phrase multiple times throughout this episode. Would you like to define the Nash equilibrium? <laughs> I would like to define it poorly and then have somebody else do it better. Is that cool? Sure. Okay. So I think the Nash equilibrium is a situation where I would not change my answer, even though I know the other person's answer. Okay. Right? Yeah. So I don't yes. regret I don't regret my answer, no matter what the other person says. Oh, well, no. You might still regret your answer, because uh, one year is better than six years. Well, I think... But the prisoner's dilemma doesn't have an obvious Nash equilibrium. It has a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Is that correct? Uh, from what I've heard, it does have a Nash equilibrium of, of both defecting, because the Nash equilibrium, as defined, is one person has no incentive to t change their strategy, uh, assuming that no one else changes their strategy. So if the other person is cooperating... And you are cooperating, you have an incentive to defect, so you yes. get one less year. Okay, if so the, the Nash equilibrium is what we actually came to, yeah. because we're both rational actors, and it's that we both defect, and we both get six years in prison, which is, which gives us a worse outcome yeah. than if we both cooperated. But and it's not the Nash equilibrium, so we're going to go and, and defect on each other. Yeah. And 
thank you for correcting my terrible uh, definition. No, <laughs> really no your, your, your definition was actually it. really uh, almost exactly what I said. I and would, this like is one of the situations where Eliezer would say, uh, this is not actually the what a rational person would do. Because, because there's super rationality. I suppose if you want to call it that, but I, w- I, I would just call it, call it irrational, it. irrational to uh, end up with a six-year term when you could have had a one-year term instead. I agree. So yeah, we could put rational decision makers in our first iteration of the game in quotes. I don't feel like that's the optimal decision for either of us. Right. Yeah. So. But within but, the constraints of the game, where yes. you're only trying to maximize one thing, and there's no other uh, social pressures or anything outside of the game... Still within constraints of the game, mm-hmm. the, we're very selfish, we're very rational. Yes. You don't care about each other, you don't care about what future, you know, favors you may have done for each other. Uh-huh. Yeah. So... As you, as you suggested just now, um, different things happen when we start to repeat the prisoner's dilemma with the same prisoners. All we right. actually commit different crimes. So we get out of jail. So here's the deal. We broke living glass, I guess, and, and pooped in the toilet in the wrong way. <laughs> and then we got caught. And then we're going to do it again later once we get out. Yeah. And then we're going to do it again later once we get out and get caught and then over and over again. But there's different results for how a rational actor is going to play that game, depending on if they know exactly how many times we're going to commit that crime versus not really knowing and, and um, doing the crime and getting caught for it uh, an unknown number of times, which is kind of fun to think about, huh? Yeah. I'm still hung up on the fact that we defected. We were talking um, in the voting episode mm-hmm. about <laughs> what my decision-making process is to lead me to vote, which is that I want other people to vote. Yes. They, I want other people to inform themselves and vote. Yeah. And you and you uh, alluded to the fact that that ties in pretty well with uh, timeless decision theory. Yes. And I was thinking more when I made the argument in terms of just deontological reasoning, right? Uh-huh. That if, it, if it's something that I would do and I would recommend for myself, I would recommend it for other people as well. Yeah. Um, and timeless decision theory is... A little more broad than that, avoid some of the pitfalls, but so say Katrina and I don't care about each other's well-being as far as who suffers in prison and who doesn't, mm-hmm. but we do respect each other's rational capacities as smart people. Mm-hmm. Then in theory, if you think she's smart and if you think you're smart, you would both cooperate. Unless he thinks I'm just highly rational and also possibly a homo economicus? Probably if he thinks you're homo economicus, yeah. But if he thinks that you're actually a rational person in the sense that you want to have as little jail time as possible, he thinks that you might cooperate. I would totally cooperate. Yeah, yeah, me too. What do you think? <laughs> I, there was actually a great t-shirt from, God, I think it was Rational Apparel or something, that said, I cooperate in the prisoner's dilemma. And I bought me one of those. They also oh, had a I awesome. defect in the prisoner's dilemma one. Oh. <laughs> I, I actually can't wear it around, though, because it has a little plus on it for, you know, cooperating plus. And it's in green because, you know, green means go. And we live in Colorado. And so everyone is like, hey, you're wearing a marijuana sh- T-shirt. I'm like, no, I don't really like marijuana. Didn't you read I, you're the a shirt? patient. No one, yeah, I know. No one ever re- lo- reads the words. They're like, ah, oh, green cross. Here, <laughs> here in Colorado, green cross means you're at a weed dispensary. It's so different depending on where you are. Yeah. So since we have things like friendship and actually wanting lower prison sentences and altruism and faith in our fellow human, mm-hmm. I, a lot of people are going to choose cooperate. We're going to stay silent, right? Yes, I think so. I think that, that that's why the fact that we both end up with six-year prison, out, prison sentences is not the rational outcome. Yeah. But the rational outcome is where we both realize that both parties involved are rational agents mm-hmm. and that we want to spend as little time in prison as possible. The way they do that is for us to both cooperate. Yeah, they call that super rationality for some reason. I don't understand why. I have a prediction to make, which is that we're going to get a lot of corrections on this episode. Sure. Bring it in. Yes, do it. That's why we have our listener (laughs) feedback at the end of the episodes now. Yeah. Okay. So, yes, totally agree with you. In my opinion, like half of morality is just basically trying to get people to always cooperate on prisoners' dilemma, dilemmas, situations. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't know if other people think that's accurate, but it's, it, it seems to be the fact that people keep trying to be like, hey, you know, be, be cooperative. It's better for everyone all the time. Right. And, and then religions show up and are like, when you defect, you go to hell. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. You don't want to go to hell. So that's another way that you can solve the prisoner's dilemma is 
people have to go to eternal suffering and damnation if they squeal, if they're not loyal to their partner in crime. Right. Um, I don't think that any religion would say that, but... but <laughs> I'm stressing the analogy, our mob boss might kill Yeah, uh, that's the rats, example right? that Scott yeah, Alexander yeah. used, is that we're, we're both in the same crime family, I guess, and our mob boss says that um, people who squeal sleep with the fishes. So, therefore, neither of us want to die, mm -hmm. and we've just been given an excuse to cooperate mm -hmm. so that we both have um, a lower jail time. So it works out. Excellent. Or so whenever or, people talk about cooperating and defecting, that's usually the sort of thing that they're talking about. Or we have reputations, or we plan on committing crimes again in the future. And in that case, there is the opportunity of maybe Stephen to punish me if I defect yes. by defecting on me next time instead of cooperating. Because of course, the best thing for him to do, from my perspective, is to cooperate every time. If I want him to cooperate every time and we're only doing this thing once, mm -hmm. then I should definitely defect. But if I want to build up some good faith with him so that he continues to cooperate with me, then I should cooperate too. As a social species, this seems to be really hardwired a bit into us, or I don't know, maybe it's beaten into us since childhood, but punishing people who defect, even if it's very, very costly to you, is a thing that people tend to do a lot. Uh, the, I think my my favorite example is the ultimatum game. Yes. Okay, where uh, a a a researcher takes two people, gives one of them ten dollar bills, says split this up however you want, and then the other person can either accept that uh, the the split, in which case you both get however you split it, or they reject it, in which case neither of you get any money. You give me back the ten dollars. So theoretically, if you're a rational actor and I'm given the opportunity to split up this ten dollars, Stephen then you should accept whatever I give you, right? As because long as it's at least one dollar. It's better than nothing, right? Right. S but... So a rational actor, rational in quotes, would always split it nine for themselves, one dollar for the other person. But when they actually do this in real life... People reject that. They're like, I'm willing to forego one dollar to punish that guy for being a dick. Yeah. Or that girl. I was listening to a teacher the other day, and he was saying, kids really understand fairness at an early age, and actually so do animals. Um, there have been a number of studies. But, you know, ask a kid to divide up a cookie, and they're going to be very, very careful that that cookie is fairly divided, because a, lot, a lot's riding on that cookie being fairly divided. Yeah. There's the way to get around that, which is, uh, say, if you're dividing a cookie or whatever it is, you split the cookie, and I get to pick which one I get first. Yeah. yeah. That's, so, a, that's a good... Yeah, but that's... We're not doing the ultimatum game anymore. I know. I just, I just, <laughs> I just like that way of getting around that, that particular problem. Sounds like it has a very easy solution. But of course, if I'm dividing the cookie, and I'm the only one... You know, if I'm bigger and stronger or something, then I get to pick whichever one I want. You're lucky you're getting anything at all. So... There, there's some interesting games, uh, permutations I've found, where some cultures tend to be more uh, vengeful than others. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't like people trying to make themselves look good by contributing too much the, to to the community pool. <laughs> no, no, th what? this was this was really interesting. It was one of, it was one of those... They're vengeful and don't like it when people con contribute too much. Because it makes the other person look really good. So it, if, it, it's one of those ones where you're passing the pot around, and every turn you can either put in some of your own money, and then it doubles, and at the end, once you're all done, everyone splits it up, or uh, you can take out some money. Uh, there's there's variations where you can punish other people for what they've done. So if they take out money, you can spend some of your own money to make them lose money. Now, you have to spend more than you make them lose. You'd have to, like, spend $4 to make them lose two. But mm -hmm. people will do it anyway just because they want to take money away from the guy that was being a jerk. There's a few cultures, and I don't remember exactly which ones they were, where if you put money in the pot, other people will destroy money to take money away from you because they're like, well, that guy's just being all highfalutin and trying to... <laughs> yeah, make the rest of us look like greedy jerks. Clearly, optimal rationalists. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah, no, it's it's just it. When the person I read uh, who was commenting on this said, "This basically looks like pure evil to me. <laughs> You're destroying wealth to destroy wealth because someone was trying to create wealth." Gosh, yeah. so that reminds me of somebody. I was talking to a divorce lawyer recently, mm -hmm. and um, she said that she got a call um, off hours. From a woman saying, he took the turkey baster. <laughs> Thanksgiving's tomorrow, and he took the turkey baster. That was on my list. 
and she told this woman, you know, so you could pay somebody hundreds of dollars an hour to make sure that you get the turkey baster Mm -hmm. and um, figure that all out, or you could go out and buy one yourself. And she said, no, transfer me to the other lawyer I want. I I want that turkey baster. Mm -hmm. And he told her the same thing. I will make sure that you get it back and that you are, you know, fairly, um, what do you call it? Compensated. Thank you. Fairly compensated for your turkey baster, but you'll be paying me um, a few hundred dollars an hour. And she said she wanted to go for it. The end result was he recommended that she go out buy the most expensive turkey baster that she could possibly find and that he would make sure that her ex paid for it. Okay. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a better solution than just getting the old one back. I was thinking the second that like the court order showed up on my door to return the turkey baster, I'd do some very nasty things to the turkey baster before I returned it. <laughs> yeah, but it's still spending <laughs> hundreds, if not thousands of dollars over a, what, $5 turkey baster? Mm-hmm. Yeah. To it's... stick it to someone. But on the other hand, that also comes in very useful, because patent trolls count on the fact that nobody's willing to go to court and spend $30,000 to defend something rather than just pay, you know, a few hundred dollars for this patent bullshit. Mm -hmm. Are we all familiar with patent trolls? Oh, I am. Okay. It's usually people who, companies that buy up pornography. Oh, you looked at me like this is not... No, I hadn't heard the... Well, because when I hear about patent trolls, it's generally through, you know, NPR and other news media, and so I guess they take (laughs) more family acceptable examples. Okay, in my my very limited experience of reading about this online on, I think it was Popat. Okay. Um, So we'll find the link. But it's it's crappy little companies that get set up specifically to buy out of copyright porn, or not out of copyright, but really cheap porn rights, Mm -hmm. put them online, and then when they get pirated, they go after the people who pirated them. So they just buy up a bunch of titles for super cheap just so that they can go after people who pirate porn, download porn illegally. And then a combination of embarrassment and not wanting to go through the expensive process of court, right. they are able to get huge amounts of money by by exploiting people. Okay. See, that's, that, that, that is very similar. When I was thinking patent trolls, I was thinking of the, again, shitty little companies that just buy a bunch of patent rights. Mm-hmm. And the way patents work in this country is really, really copyright and intellectual property law in the U.S. is broken right now. And they need to do something about it. But they will buy up bullshit copyrights that someone has copyrighted a graphical UI element, for example. Or, oh, 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 the one I'm most familiar, most recently heard about is a supplement for um, for muscle building okay. um, shakes or whatever. There's a simple amino acid that's added to all of them. And there was a university that did some research on it, filed a patent related to it. And this company bought up the patent for really cheap because it turned out that the, it didn't do what they wanted it to do. So they just kind of, the university just kind of left it on the shelf. They bought it up real cheap and the guy started going after every single protein muscle mass shake on the market saying, you have this amino acid in your, in your, in your supplement. You have to give us a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars, whatever it is. And most places were just like, fine, whatever. Here's your, here's your money. But this one guy was like, no, screw you. And he's spending literally millions of dollars in court to to fight this. And he personally is not ever going to make that money back. However, across the industry as a whole, it's uh, estimated to be about $2 billion worth. So he's he's doing a lot of good by fighting this, but he was never going to see that money back okay. or make a return on it. So, so that's he's not he's not acting as a rational actor in this particular game. No, he's what... not. He's, he's being like the lady with the turkey baster. But in this case, <laughs> because, it's for justice. Yes. So he's, he's is the lady thing. with the turkey baster. He's not a rational actor and he's not reaching Nash equilibrium, but he is um, an irrational human being. And he's doing, quote, the right thing. Yeah. Well, yeah. if yeah. everyone were to do this, then patent trolls would know they cannot get away with just buying up shitty patents and threatening people with legal action. Man, nobody is going to cooperate with his patent trolls. Right. It's, it's, it's why the U- U.S. doesn't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> Life sounds really easy if you're willing to compromise all your ethics. <laughs> right? There's a lot of easy ways to make money if you want to just be a bad person. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of not negotiating with terrorists, would you like to talk about the chicken game? Yeah. 
Uh, are we okay moving on to that? I actually wanted to talk about um, the Prisoner's Dilemma and the people who got together and created programs and a competition ah, yes. to win the iterated Prisoner's Dilemma, so the, the Prisoner's Dilemma that goes over and over and over again. And there was one top strategy um, by Anatole Rappaport, which is an awesome name. And it was the simplest of any program entered with only four lines of basic, and it won the contest. The strategy was just to cooperate on the first iteration of the game, and then after that, do what the opponent did on the previous move. It's called tit for tat, right? A tit for tat with forgiveness. So it would also randomly do something nice at some point, I think. So there's a small probability that the player is going to cooperate anyway, even if the opponent defects. Okay. Yeah, and it worked really well. And um, Wikipedia <laughs> put together a, a list of conditions that are necessary for a strategy to be successful. Mm -hmm. One is that a, the most important is the, the strategy be nice. So it's not going to defect before the opponent does. It retaliating. So if the opponent does defect, then it also defects. It's forgiving. So even though it retaliates, they fall back to cooperating if the opponent does not continue to defect, and that stops the long runs of revenge and counter-revenge and maximizes points. And finally, non-envious, so not striving to score more than the opponent leads to the best outcome. Yeah. When you mentioned the name Rappaport, it made me think of an essay that I read by uh, Daniel Dennett. Where it was, it was called How to Criticize with Kindness, Philosopher Daniel Dennett, and the Four Steps to Arguing Intelligently. And as he went on to list how the program played its game, I'm like, oh, that's the same rap of war. Uh, yeah. Cool. There, I mean, what's, I, this, what's the, that Anatole? Is that the rap of war's first name? Anatole Rappaport. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sweet. And I'm going to link to that, that Brain Pickings article with, by Daniel Dennett because it's, uh, that's, it's the best way to argue. But that's we don't have to fantastic. go over it now because it's not really relevant. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I, 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 I always think of the Pansy Parkinsons again the, from from the methods of rationality as the worst players because they would always defect, and I think that's why you want a I guess they're calling it a super rational strategy mm -hmm. rather than a rational one because in a world where you might run into a copy of yourself, if you can't even cooperate with yourself, you have some serious issues. Well, and and I think you know since I'm unlikely to run into another Steven Zuber. But I am likely to run in, or I am more likely to run into people that think along the same lines that I do. Mm -hmm. And if I can't get along with people who think like I do, then I think I'm thinking wrong. Mm -hmm. So that that that's where I think that the generalizability of my my rule to cooperate, at least until I get screwed over a bunch of times, maybe then I'll just start defecting out of spite. Yeah. But my tendency is to to cooperate based on that premise. Yeah. Well, people spend a lot of time studying cooperation, altruistic behavior um, among both humans and animals trying to figure out where it came from and, and that's why um that's why i was looking at the evolutionary game theory but i think that we should talk about chicken first okay do you want to set up the game again and katrina and i can play chicken so the game of chicken is very simple it's been so shown in multiple movies two people get in a car they drive at each other different cars yeah sorry <laughs> two people get in different cars they point the cars at each other they step on the gas and they drive towards each other and if the two cars hit, they're both going to die, obviously. Ooh. A two head-on collisions is a terrible thing to have. So it's going fast. Yes, they're going fast, and they're not wearing seatbelts, and they don't have airbags. This is in the 1950s. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are we greasers? You probably are. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'm smoking a cigarette. That's right. <laughs> Combing your hair whenever people are looking. Uh, so you're, you're driving <laughs> at each other, and obviously you don't want to collide because you don't want to die. No. So someone is going to swerve off to the right. The person who swerves off to the right first is a chicken. I freaking have no guts at all. So that person loses. The The question is, how do you win in a game of chicken? And the best answer is, after you start, you remove your steering wheel, you throw it out the window while the other guy is looking at you, and then you just keep going. Because <laughs> you're like, dude, I can't steer away. I have... I have committed to going forward by removing my ability to steer right. You have to be the one that steers right. That solution sounds generalizable outside of just the game of chicken. Whoops. Story time from six or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. We did a lot of all the stupid stuff you weren't supposed to do when you got oh, cars, no. including uh, playing chicken with strangers. In the no, room. you didn't. The one time. So <laughs> we, we didn't crash, but it still has a fun story. Right. So what we, long story short, 
we were chasing this random car around because that's what we did. We would just chase them until they got pissed, and then we'd we'd run away. What the hell is wrong with you? We were jerks. Jesus. How old? Sixteen ish. Okay. Um, so this car is going like seventy five miles an hour down a thirty five mile an hour street. We chase them. They turn left across traffic to get down to the side road, so we have to wait till traffic leaves before we can follow them. Mm-hmm. And then they flash their high beams, and we're playing chicken. And where did you grow up? Did you grow up like on some farm? No, that was in Fort Collins. I was in Fort Collins, yeah, people. I you know, can't, can't when trust I was them. a kid. Never going up there now. When I was the Hedonic Index the kids... Step City went way up as soon as we left. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the kids from Fort Collins said that they would just throw knives at their own hands for fun. I don't know which kids you were talking about. We weren't that stupid. This was this was more fun than that. Well, oh. you do seem <laughs> you do seem smarter than the average bear. So, <laughs> well, what happened? I wasn't. I. I, I I wasn't smarter than the average bear ten years ago. Okay, but uh, the so way flash the lights at each other. Yeah, so the way this worked out is we we're going pretty fast, and then we both. This actually c- concerned me right around at the time when we were kind of getting close to each other. I was like, "What if we both turn the same way?" Because we didn't know the rule was turn right. Ah. In fact, we both turned left. Oh uh, no! <laughs> well, it still worked out. Okay. Yes, but, because you because you turned the same. But they they blew a tire as they as they turned. Oh. So us being super nice, we were just messing around. We get out to see if everything is okay. Uh-huh. Them being a bunch of thugs, get out to you know flex and be all scary. Uh-huh. But it happens to be where one of our number knew one of their number. Okay. And it ended amicably. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, that was that was my only experience of the game of chicken. And no one died. No one died. So the, I can look back at a number of incidents. Actually, you from did my... both turn left because you you turned left. I wasn't driving. Oh, but the guy you were with turned left. Right. And if the other guy went their the left. same way as you, no, then they turned their left. So it's an op- they turned up. If, no, if they turned their left, it would have been fine. They turned right, and you turned left, and that's why you went in the same direction. They turned my right. They turned their left. We both. They we both. Took left turn. They, oh, oh, they oh, okay. All right. Other, so you both turned left. Yeah, they're I, fine. I, yeah, I they're can't remember if we actually turned or not. I think they might have just turned. I'll oh have to find my out. Goodness. Anyway, so don't try this at home. If we were to turn this into a decision tree, mm-hmm. <laughs> if we were to talk about this in a game theory way, what would it look like? Uh, it would be the payoff is not being a chicken. Well, the payoff of not being a chicken is one, but the payoff of dying is negative ten. Oh, sure. Oh, it's only negative ten versus one, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it depends on how much you value your life, I guess. If you're playing chicken, I'm assuming you don't value it all that much? Or you think but, you're immortal. Okay, That's yeah, exactly what I was going to say, is teenagers think they're immortal, so... Yeah. <laughs> That's a stereotype, in a way. And apparently it's true sometimes. At least in some cases. <laughs> Or you just don't want to live anymore if you live in Fort Collins. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't that we were just goofing around. Okay. <laughs> and the guy I was with was a very good driver. Okay. James Bond style. Okay, was awesome. so the result, if you both choose... Um, what, so if you both choose cooperate, what, do you run into each other? Is that what the situation is? Uh, I don't think it has the same sort of <laughs> payoff matrix as a prisoner's dilemma does. Okay, if you choose straight versus turn. Mm-hmm. So if you both choose straight, then... It's negative 10 for both of you. Yeah. If you choose straight and they choose swerve, Mm -hmm. what do they get? Zero? I'm assuming negative one for being a chicken. Oh, negative one and you get a positive one. Yeah. And then um, if you both turn, then what? Um, I guess... Is it zero? I guess if you were to both turn at exactly the same time, it'd be a tie. Yeah. It'd be a zero. It'd be zero. Yeah. So that's like the best opportunity is you both turn at exactly the same time. Yeah. This strikes me as the kind of game where you couldn't generalize your optimization strategy no. the same way you can with the prisoner's dilemma. Yeah. Because if you're both driving, say you hit cruise control at 75, and then you see the other party throw their stream <laughs> the window at the same time you do, mm. then you just both have a few seconds oh, to regret right. that you both made that decision. So. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think it's you a... You get out of cruise control, Steven. But you can't turn. I guess yeah. you can slam on your brakes, but Wait, you're sticking with the game. You can't turn in cruise control. No, what if, world if, you th- is if, you, this? if you threw your sting wheel out the window. <laughs> oh. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, so the so the strategy where you where you declare to them, "I'm going to go straight until the game's over." Yeah. You can't do that, and want your opponent to do the same thing like you can in a prisoner's dilemma right. if you cooperate. So. Yeah. But uh, it's 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 a demonstration of the fact that when you're playing these sorts of games, what you want to do is uh, change your player's opinion of you. You want to portray yourself as the biggest, most badass, not going to turn no matter what thing, no matter what person. And whoever portrays that best generally is the one that wins because the other person turns away sooner. So it is it is literally about modeling your opponent. And uh, the problem with trying to model your opponents on things like that is that people lie all the time. Mm-hmm. And people can bluster and say, you know, that they're more, more uh, 
courageous than they actually are. So they have an extra steering wheel to throw out the window? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that's that's the whole point of the throwing the steering wheel away. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's it is a credible pre-commitment. Mm-hmm. The, the saying, I'm not going to turn away, is a pre-commitment, but mm-hmm. it's not a very credible one. No. The rowing your steering wheel out is a credible pre-commitment. And that is uh, why the United States does not, in theory, negotiate with terrorists. Because if you never ego- negotiate with a terrorist throughout your 200-year history, and if you're willing to take giant losses in civilians or whatever to not negotiate with terrorists, then there is not much incentive for terrorists to target you. Because they're like, well, no matter what happens, we're not going to get what we want. We're just going to kill a bunch of people and then get killed as well. Well, it depends on what they want. Well, yes. If, if they just want to kill a bunch of people, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> that That's the... But pre-9-11. Funny. Funny. Yeah. In that nice Sorry. little window, post-Cold War, pre-9-11, we had this nice window where that wasn't the goal of the opponents. So. Right. <laughs> the goal was to get your plane to Tahiti or wherever so they can you know, defect to the local government or make a statement. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what people did back then. But yeah, the, the whole that's that's the same reason why if you're in a country where there is a lot of kidnapping, the best strategy for the society as general is to never pay any ransoms, even though it means their family members die. Because for society in general, but not for you and your family. Exactly. That's, well, that's not if, how things work. If everyone in society never paid a ransom, there'd be no incentive for kidnappers to kidnap anyone, and kidnapping would stop entirely. You wouldn't have to worry about being kidnapped. But yeah, like you say... Actors work on an individual level. Yes. And so people do pay ransoms because they do want their family members back, and therefore kidnapping continues to be a problem. So that's, yeah. That, that's, that's... It's the same kind of defection, except now it, it feels much more personal when it's your family member that's been kidnapped. All of a sudden you're like, I don't want to cooperate with all of society. I'm going to defect because fuck you, I want my family member mm. back. Yeah. That really does remind me of um, evolutionary stable strategies. Yeah. Yeah. Like the Hawk and Dove game. So, our first item that we have to re-record is Hawk and Dove games, which Katrina was telling us about. Katrina, what is this Hawk and Dove game that you speak of? The Hawk and Dove game is an example of evolutionary game theory, and it was proposed by John Maynard Smith and George Price in 1973. So, the way that it works is that there's two strategies. Uh, hawk and dove. Hawk is the aggressive strategy and dove is the peaceful strategy. And the idea is <clears throat> that they're both meeting over a pile of food. So when when a dove and a dove, the two peaceful strategies meet up, they equally share the food and they both get a positive three fitness. When a dove and a hawk meet up, the hawk is easily able to um, take more food than the dove because it's so aggressive and the dove is peaceful. So the hawk gets five plus five fitness and the dove is plus one. However, when two hawks meet up, they even injure each other a little bit and maybe even destroy the food. They each get zero. Sounds kind of harsh. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a harsh world out there. So from an you know, if you're thinking about it as a prisoner's dilemma and there's player one and player two playing those strategies, do you know which ones would be the Nash Equilibria? I would, well, I would go with uh, both going for doves because I like cooperative strategies, but I recall that was it's not, not Nash. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. So um, the Nash, you said it was a strange mixed strategy where some people are hawk at a certain percentage? Uh, yeah, so... <laughs> Well, that's the evolutionarily stable strategy is mixed, but the Nash equilibrium, if you're again doing a player one, player two, and they can play either strategy. So if player one plays dove, player two is going to be happiest playing hawk. Right. Right? Yes, if, player two's a dick. <laughs> so that they'll get five plus five and the, the dove person will get plus one. If... Alternatively, and again, uh, this is a situation like the prisoner's dilemma where they're really choosing at the same time. But, you know, looking back, dove person isn't going to want to change their strategy knowing that the other player played hawk. Because if they were to play hawk, then neither of them would get anything. It would, they would get zero, and one's better than zero. So the best, stra- the um, Nash Equilibrium strategy is hawk, 
dove or dove hawk. Hmm. Right. So there are two Nash equilibria. Okay. Now, if you're talking about um, an, an animal species that has aggressive individuals and peaceful individuals, it's easy to see, kind of taking it from the Nash equilibrium, that the best strategy involves both hawks and doves. Um, that's why it's a mixed strategy. As an animal, you don't really get to choose which one you're going to do at any one moment, or you might. Um, it depends. So it's going to go into a mixed strategy where the animals play dove a certain amount of times or a certain amount of individuals in the population play dove and a certain amount of individuals in the population play hawk. That this, I, I see where you're saying, what you're saying, how that, that's the Nash equilibrium, but my human fairness instincts makes me very mad about this. <laughs> I, I do not want the other person to choose hawk and instead of dove because I would much rather us both have three than me only have one. Yeah, well, I think that's why we need governmental regulation of hawks and doves. I suppose. Or I could just be a <laughs> hawk, too, and, you know, take the hit in order to impose costs on that guy. You could, yes. And if you're the only hawk around, it sounds like a win for you, uh, despite probably not mm -hmm. being well-liked. Right. If you're the only hawk um, amongst a group of doves, that's obviously a great situation for you. Um, but... If you're the only dove around groups of hawks that are just kind of fighting each other all the time and distracted by that, that might be a good situation for you as well. Ah, because the other hawks are never eating. All busy fighting. <laughs> That's right. What? Plus, you could probably eat the dead ones if you're really hungry, so... <laughs> yeah, so, well, you can, so you can see how both of those strategies are good strategies in certain circumstances. But, interestingly, this is actually a bit different than the prisoner's dilemma because the evolutionarily stable strategy mm -hmm. is to have both hawks and doves okay. at certain concentrations okay. in the community. So that's what's known as a mixed strategy. Yes. In which we Why have a, a mixed... <laughs> <laughs> Um, evolutionarily stable mixed strategy, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh -huh. We haven't talked about mixed Nash equilibrium. Right. Um, which is that the best strategy isn't to, in an iterated game, isn't to always do, you know, one thing to always defect or whatever. Mm -hmm. It is to play one part with a certain probability and play the other with another probability. Okay. Now, if you're an animal, you are either a hawk or a dove. You can't show up and say, I'm going to play dove this time, or I'm going to play hawk this time. But this works on a population level, right? Okay. And the definition of an evolutionarily stable strategy is one that will persist mm -hmm. in that way and be resistant to invasions from other organisms with a different strategy, right? Okay. It's not gonna, if, if your neighbors come over and they're like, okay, yeah, but we do it this way, mm -hmm. they're gonna be the ones that die out and not you. Cool. Versus if it's not an evolutionarily stable strategy, you guys are gonna be eventually replaced by your neighbors. And you were mentioning before the podcast that this sounds cool, but doesn't have a lot of buy-in? Oh, um, actually, no, this, no, has, a, this has a great deal of buy-in. The okay. issue, the issue with um, evolutionary game theory mm -hmm. is that although there are tons and tons of situations in which it very likely applies, because the world is a very complicated place, it's incredibly difficult to figure out exactly what the you know, what are the fitness results of this? Mm. What are the fitness results of this specific action? Right. And to disentangle it from the fitness results of all the other actions that an animal is going to take or a population is going to take. Yeah. And just random things that no one can control. Exactly. So it's very difficult to actually measure this, although it certainly applies to a lot of situations. For example, it's applied very, very often to mating strategies. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, you, do you remember the one I'm going to talk about? Uh, probably, but go ahead. Okay, the, I have mentioned this before. Yeah, okay, okay, the one that with the, the male that acts as a female to get oh, into the harem? so that's one of them, okay. and, and that's a very common one. So in cuttlefish, in various types of beetles, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, there are different male morphs. So there's a male that looks like a female, mm -hmm. 
versus a male that looks like a, a big burly male. And it's the dominant male versus the sneaky male situation. So those are the different strategies that are being played for populations in which both of those persist, that there's the, the big dominant male and also the sneaky male, we kind of assume that it's evolutionarily stable, uh, given the circumstances that, of course, you know, we don't know because it's really hard to measure this stuff. I was actually going to give a gender-swapped example. Okay. There are insects, and um, the ones I heard about were, I think, midges, but in dragonflies, I've seen this too, that there are two different female morphs. There's a female that looks very different from the male, and then there's a female that looks quite a bit like the male. Interestingly, in, in the species I've heard about, including dragonflies, females have, suffer a big fitness hit. Let me take a moment to explain what fitness is, by the way, because I don't think we've defined it. Fitness is defined by the, um, it's pretty much the number of offspring that you have that can themselves have offspring. So your ability to pass on your genes and therefore pass on that trait. And when we speak of fitness, we generally, I think it's more uh, an action that increases your probability towards fitness. Right. Rather, rather than because like, we're talking about it in populations often, exactly. Rather than in individual, people. or even if it's just an individuals, you know, doing a certain thing might increase your. Uh, if it was definitely to increase your fitness, then everyone would do it all the time. But it, it, there's there's probability variances here, right? Well, see, that's the thing is that if there's a a mixed strategy equilibrium, right? If there's a, a mixed evolutionary strategy, um, stable strategy, then actually, what's best? what's best. is it, It's not necessarily what's best, but what's stable. And, and that's also an important distinction to make, kind of like in the prisoner's yeah. dilemma, what's best mm -hmm. is not always what people actually do. And that's the same in wild populations and evolutionary history too. So, I'm sorry, what were you saying? Well, I, I was just saying that I think fitness, um, you know, so whatever it is, uh, finding finding a successful mate uh, increases your your genetic fitness, but say, um, whatever, sharing a pile of food if you're a dove, you know, might, might probabilistically increase your fitness because then you live to, you know, find a mate another day. Right? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. So not all of it's so direct, like how many, like literally how many matings can I have? Like how many gametes can I spread? It might mm -hmm. be, do I get more sunlight? I'm a tree. Um, and I have a large body size. Do I get more sunlight and therefore have um, be able to do more photosynthesis to create more gametes? Or mm -hmm. yeah, so there's there's all sorts of indirect ways to get there. I was um, thinking, I think in terms of evolutionary arms races, yes, which is a fun thought experiment. You made me think of trees, but that'll get us too far afield. I want you to keep going. Yeah, trees are trees are a great example of um, the idea of evolutionary game theory in practice and have been studied. And they're a little bit more simple, I guess, than, than some of the other animals that you can study. When they're not running the around trees, for food. Since they're simpler? No, I no, want to you talk, want to do the ground. Okay, dragonflies are more interesting. dragonflies. Okay. Plants are boring. That's, well, depends on your opinions. Because they're not running around and hunting and looking for mates and stuff. See, I hate dragonflies because they're really big. Oh, I like dragonflies. Oh, there, are, there are other bugs that I don't like. Yeah? Yeah. I, I've never had a problem with spiders. Everyone right. freaks out about spiders, but spiders don't fly at your face. Spiders. They're on the wall and you just mush them. Spiders are my Wash your hands. Dragonflies yeah. don't fly at your face either. They turn at the last second. <laughs> Fuck those guys. And their stupid chicken playing. <laughs> I am not a fan. I'm a fan of dragonflies. This example's going forward. To reiterate. I'm sorry I used the word reiterate, but I'm not actually sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Dragonfly. I kind of want to unpack that, but no. But okay. No. This like, is why going. would you be sorry in the first Shush. place? Okay. Okay, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> because iterate, like it's being redundant in the same word. Iterate is repeat. Mm -hmm. To reiterate, re-repeat. That doesn't make any sense. Maybe you'd already iterated once, so you are reiterating now. You just keep iterating. Regardless, can we please continue? Oh! <laughs> See, that's the one that actually kind of bugs me. Yeah. <laughs> but you can, the language evolves. You just go along with it, right? Two females. <laughs> Two females. One looks like the male. One looks a lot like the male. One doesn't. In dragonflies, interestingly, um, females will actually leave the areas that have the most prey density. Okay. Because they suffer... Well, the idea is 
because they suffer um, a significant fitness penalty for being around males if they're not breeding. Why? Because males are really pushy and they want to mate a lot. Um, they have a, a high drive to mate. And so, so the females are busy getting getting the females want to get food instead of eating. Right. I see. They're busy, and not only that, it's not like a quick thing. They hold on to the females, and um, a lot of species do mate guarding. Mm. So they will literally hold on to her until she lays her eggs. Now, if you're a pre-reproductive female, and so this is just like a non-starter for you, right? All of this is pure loss. Yeah. So the result is that a lot of pre-reproductive females just don't hang out where the mating sites are. They have less opportunity to get food, but get more food because they're not being forced to the ground, grabbed onto their head uh, by the by the males' circes, like little little butt barbs. Okay. <laughs> so. Um, anyway, so, so the ones that look like males don't have that problem. Exactly. Solution. Cool. There's ones that look like males. They don't get, they might have, um, a lower fitness in one way because they don't get as many matings, mm -hmm. but they do get to get stronger so that they can produce more eggs. Right. So that's, um, a fitness plus. Yeah. So all of these, so that's like a fun, a fun Game theory question too. Yeah. But bring bring this home for game theory for for the rational actor. Or is this just about bugs and animals and it's not something that we can generalize to the population? Well it's a, it's a, an example of mixed strategy. Yeah. So, so how, it is well, an guess... example of mixed strategy, but we can't actually calculate if it's mixed strategy unless we're able to actually track the fitness for those different kinds of females. Mm hmm And we're not? Year after year. I think a lot of people try. I mean, I was looking at um, Scott Alexander's example of vampire bats feeding each other. Yeah. So you can go out, be a vampire bat, and not get any blood. Well, maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> you what? <laughs> <laughs> you said I could go out and be a vampire bat. I do not have those skills. A vampire bat can go out, <laughs> okay. look for a meal, and not get a blood meal. They expend a huge amount of energy. It's a, it's a big cost to choose to hunt. So when they get back to the roost, they're in trouble. Um, but oftentimes they're taken care of by a neighbor in their roost that has actually had a chance to get a blood meal. So they're fed. And that's good, right? But it's, it's, a, it's a minor cost to the bat that's feeding the other bat and a huge benefit to the bat that's being fed. Um, and in that example, there, was some, there were some almost anecdotal examples that was seen that bats that hadn't cooperated by feeding other bats were in turn not being fed by other bats. Um, so that, that so was... So in many social species, this sort of thing evolves pretty quickly. The idea of, of fairness fairness and cooperating over time and punishment, yes. So fairness and, and punishment are examples of mixed strategies? Those are examples of, of creating super rational. Yeah, of nature having adapted. Mm -hmm. Well, because that sort of makes sense, right? Uh, there was a great example in Robert Cialdini's uh, Influence, Science, and Practice. Robert Cialdini, in his book Influence, Science, and Practice, which is a must-read, so the book discusses price gouging, which the idea is during a time of shortage of scarcity, people will go nuts and try and procure as much of that resource as possible, whether it be guns. There's the running joke in the last eight years or really whenever there's a Democrat in the White House that the president's a great gun salesman right. um, because of all the proposed, you know, supposed gun bans or something. Um, there was a great experiment or it wasn't even an experiment it happened to be done in real life where in a county in florida they banned phosphate detergents and people went berserk they would drive to the next county in convoys and come back with phosphate detergents just because and no one could have cared less until they're they, actually banned uh, nationwide now oh nice that makes sense i i it's uh it but it was just a fun example that people couldn't have cared less until they were told they can't have it then they then they yeah. lost their mind i did the yeah. same thing actually when my uh my phone provider went from unlimited data to 
uh, <laughs> limits data. So yeah. I was like, all right, forget this. And I switched carriers, even though previously I'd only been using like less than a gig a month, but it was just the idea. I liked the option. So in full knowledge of what I was doing, I switched carriers. Um, anyway, so in this example uh, that Shildini gives in the book, it was during, when was that big oil crisis? Mid 80s? Oh, the big one? Uh, that was late 70s. Late yeah. 70s. Carter administration, right? Yes. Okay, yeah, that rings a bell. So people were stockpiling gas, however you can think of, buying drums and filling it and stuff. And for the most part, gas stations just dried up. And then one guy realized, hey, I can make a quick buck and you know, triple or quadruple the price of gas. And it sold in the short term. People you know, were still like, well, this is ridiculous, but I need it, so I'll, I'll go ahead and take it. Uh, what worked out happening a few weeks later after things stabilized, people remembered what a dick this guy was by overcharging, so they stopped going to him and apparently his business closed. Uh, all of that is hearsay from what, what was in that book, but uh, taking, taking it all as true, it's a, it's a pretty good example of... Um, that, only happens, that only happens because he was the only one who did it. That's true. If, if everyone... If, if, say, they had all gotten together and said, all right, guys, want to be dicks, and they all agreed? <laughs> they don't have to be dicks. That's yeah. what's known as the invisible hand of the market. Right. We... Supply goes down, the price goes up. And economists think that this is like a good thing when, well, not necessarily a good, good thing, but when there is a shortage of something, the prices should go up, and keeping them artificially low just leads to, you know, more shortages. Because when the price goes up, first of all, people generally buy less if they uh, don't need it as badly. And also the people that do have it are more incentivized to sell, right? I believe, Katrina, you mentioned that too? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that there are counterexamples to that in real life. You know, like, it, so it might make sense in a lot of cases. Um, but, you know, like in the example of, say, if there was a monopoly of three large businesses that owned 90% of the water in the country like the, the drinking water. And they were like, hey, let's all get together. They, they have some backdoor deal where they're like, if we all tripled prices tomorrow morning, no one can complain. And just Is this Tank Girl? Uh, <laughs> no, but it could be. Uh, but a real-life example awesome. could be something like Comcast, right? Where but, but that's Com in cases of monopolies, and I think it's supposed to be a more general case that in, in during when you have an efficient market, you uh, price gouging is not to be that discouraged. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, um, I mean, of course, governments... And governments and people, because governments are made of people, react with anger over people who are supposedly price gouging and making price ceilings can cause a lot more damage. And it's it's kind of tricky, though, because it does hit that fairness instinct again. The, you know, mm -hmm. the water is always this price. And now that all of a sudden that I need it badly, you're going to screw me. It, yeah, I, I can understand why people get emotional about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it, it's, it brings a lot of stuff the table and I'm not an economist, so I guess I can't weigh in too much, but I do think that, you know, uh, you can, you can pretend that there were like three companies like Comcast, but for whatever reason, all the CEOs got together and they were like, Hey, let's just keep doing uh, shitty business and, you know, double our prices. I, I can't see a reason why it couldn't work in real life, even if there wasn't a monopoly, but it is the same reason why you'll pay like $15 for a sandwich on an airplane. Oh yeah. Well, they they did the same thing with light bulbs for a while. I don't remember how many years it lasted, but they had a uh, a very uh, I guess you could even call it a conspiracy among the major light bulb manufacturers to sell shitty light bulbs because they could make more money that way. Oh yeah, Stephen, if you're really concerned about the water water issue, if there's not enough water and it's really expensive, then I mean you could ask for some sort of outside regulatory. Um, solution that doesn't involve price ceilings. Like there's other options too. And For there... example, like you could have um, tax money buy up certain amounts of water and redistribute them to people who are under a certain income level or or something like that. And there or is give also people a basic water, a base water amount. <laughs> right. And there is always kind of the worry <laughs> that I mean. It, the theory is that people will pay more if they value the thing more. But for people that have a whole lot of money, it doesn't cost them anything to bid up a a, a bottle of water to ten thousand dollars, even for some really shitty use. When someone who doesn't have that kind of money needs it to live, so you know, and another argument to have more equality in society, it makes the prices more accurately reflect how people actually value things. Hmm. Yeah, that's true. I mean, so, you know, like housing might be a, a more realistic example, because I don't think we're in any shortage of running out of water in the United States. 
but I think so in Denver. Where you are? Uh, I mean, maybe yeah. There might be places like literal deserts California? in the United States. Yeah, California's but, having issues. But it's not like their taps are turning off. They're just they're just you know it's costing more. But that said, I just or it's example. actually the issue is that it's not costing more. It is kept artificially low, and that's why there's water shortages. People literally don't have any. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's a, a real life example of where um, price ceilings are problematic. Gotcha. And I just had another really good example, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, housing. You know, I, I mean, we can we can dive into this in another in a different yeah. podcast. So yeah, game different. theory, guys. Yeah, yeah right. Game Sorry. Theory. I, I wanted to mention a fun mixed strategy uh, game that I'd heard of uh -huh. where uh, you and six other people wake up in a room, uh, all separate rooms. You're not together. You've been uh, knocked out and dragged there by the, you know, evil mad scientist economist who wants to study your behavior, I guess. Uh, OK. And, and you have a button. And within the next 10 minutes, you can either choose to push the button or not. And if one person pushes the button, you're all let free. But if no people or more than one person pushes the button, then you're all killed. The question is, what's the best strategy in that case? And ultimately, it's just roll a die. And if it comes up six, push the button. And that mm -hmm. way, statistically, you'll, you'll usually have one person push the button. Well, more often than if you had any other sort of decision theory, you will have only one person push the button. Okay. So you go into a room, there's a die. And the instructions are, if uh, <laughs> no, you, you you're do not in an identical die. room to six other people. <laughs> no, the economist isn't that nice. This is why everyone has to carry an emergency die with them at all times. I see. Because <laughs> something like this could happen. It's a possibility. It's happened before. And the cost of carrying a die are so low. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's the same reason I carry everything that I carry. <laughs> Adds up after a while, though. Yeah, it does. What's your equip weight? Uh, right now, 72 kilograms. Okay. Oh, dude, you got to get the strong back perk. I'm, just, I'm up to 300 pounds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. That's uh, a good answer. Hey, want to bring this home to game theory? I want to hear an example. <laughs> I want to hear an example of, uh, of a mixed strategy that people actually do or can do or whatever it is, right? Yeah, the box is you guys, because I don't really know much about the box. No problem. The box is a solo game strategy situation. Uh, it's, a, it's more of a morality game than, than having anything really, I think, to do with game strategy. Well, morality can have something to do with game strategy, right? It, it seemed more like a joke thing. Like, Stephen was like, before the guy even got to the plus side of the box. Oh, um, yeah. That Well, the joke is making fun of the box. So... Um, the idea of the box has been a moral, what do you call it? A moral dilemma for a long time. So the idea is someone comes in, they offer you a box. If you hit the button, then uh, one person in the die, one person in the world who you do not know, a stranger dies, but you also get a million dollars, right? <laughs> yes, and the joke was you, uh, you you said one person in the world you do not know dies, and Stephen goes, push the button. Yeah, they, they there's there was some someone made a video where they hadn't even finished ah. their pitch and they just kept pressing the button over and over. And it's <laughs> hilarious. We'll link it. If I can, yeah, was if this one of us can find Saturday it. morning breakfast cereal. Oh no, no, this was an actual yeah. video. Um, but it could have what been also on Saturday morning breakfast cereal. Okay. They, they it was had also a, a serious movie with Jennifer Lopez. Ooh, what was it mm -hmm. called? The box. Oh, it was literally called the box. Maybe or the decision or something. Okay. Take a look. Oh Did yeah, there was totally a movie about this. Did you find it? So that's what this, these um, things were making fun of was the movie, which was made uh, based on a very simple moral dilemma. Uh, you know, kind of the idea that if it's somebody else's life, who cares? I get a million dollars. I'm the individual making this decision, and that's considering that I am a strictly selfish economic actor then I should definitely take the million dollars, right? Yeah, I think that's it. I'm not sure what its, uh, what it's real connection is. Oh, sorry, go mm -hmm. ahead. Yeah, of course, in the movie, they press the button, and it's the person who dies is like the doctor of the sick son, and the son's going to die, and then it's a whole horrible nightmare. Oh, that, of course it is, right? Comes back to them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be so much of a movie if just some random person in some third world country died, you know, every time they press the button. It had to be somebody that would turn around and fuck them, so... Mm -hmm. Sounds terrible. <laughs> yes. So I'm not sure what its real tie-in is to, to game theory other than being just a fun little intuition pump about, I guess, people's cost-benefit analysis versus their own money mm -hmm. and someone, some random person dying. Of course, yeah. 
there is also solo game theory, right? You don't have to have two players. Don't you? No, no, it you can just do game. it on your own. It depends on the game. You can just uh, go through a decision tree on your own and make the right decisions. Oh, sure, but isn't part of game theory like anticipating the actions of other agents? Mm, not necessarily. It's uh, You can be playing against the world, which is set up in a certain way. Or, I guess, playing against yourself. Uh, all right, okay, fair enough. What was I going to say about... Oh, the, the joke about the box would be, I guess, if you could, you could mm. press the button half a dozen times and give $6 million to charity and still probably... Save. Yeah. Many more people than the six people you killed. <laughs> Unless, like, the six people you kill are, like, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and, like, you know, people are destined <laughs> to save billions of people. Uh, everyone would want to meet you if you announce that beforehand. Oh, man, yeah. Oh, yeah, that'd be a good way to, to get around if it's, it. If it's strangers. <laughs> That's how you demand a meeting with the president. If you strangers and you're like, hey, I'm going to press this however many times. Uh, so you're going to want to know me, not be strange. <laughs> That's true. So I'm I... desperate to be popular. <laughs> right. Okay, so this was something that I brought up originally while the music was playing, so I'm going to go ahead and bring it up again now, even though I don't remember exactly how it came up. But um, th this, I guess, is not as controversial as I first thought it was. I was really hesitant to talk about it the, when we first recorded, and now I feel a lot better because of the feedback I got from the two of you. But uh, I had been taught in high school that the official reason the U.S. gave for dropping nuclear weapons on Japan uh, was the the actual reason. Uh, that was still being taught the party line, that uh, it was the bombs were dropped, our grandparents dropped those bombs to uh, hasten the end of the war and save ultimately hundreds of thousands of lives. And nowadays, the consensus is that that really doesn't seem to have mattered. Japan was already discussing surrendering, and it's not like the bombs themselves changed uh, how the war was, how the war was being fought, because we were already, both sides were already leveling cities, wiping out entire city populations, just destroying the land in order to get to the factories that created the war's mach um, machines of war. So nothing tactically or strategically was different about it, aside from the fact that I guess now you only need one bomber instead of a fleet of them. Uh, but the, the, the effects on the ground were identical. The real reason that the United States decided to use the weapon was to show the Soviet Union, since the Cold War was already ramping up before World War II was over, that we had these weapons and we were willing to use them on civilian populations. Mm -hmm. It was a sort of... Uh, we were talking earlier about how you pre-commit to your opponent to showing them you're really serious by throwing your steering wheel out the window of your car. Mm -hmm. It was obviously not that big of a commitment, but it was a very similar thing where you are demonstrating your willingness to do this so they will take you more seriously and maybe swerve before you were to swerve. That's interesting. Do you think when people uh, plan bomb droppings and stuff like that, they actually write things out in terms of lives, stay, lives saved versus lives spent? In general, I don't know. I don't think so. But at the highest levels, I believe that was the thinking in this particular case. Because hundreds of thousands of people were killed in those bombs yeah. being dropped. Yeah. So about 145,000 people in Hiroshima alone. Right. No, it, it was horrific. They they were they were wiping cities out everywhere, and it was it was a nasty war. One of the worst we've seen for civilian casualties in history, I think. Uh, I mean, it depends on how far back you want to go. It turns out that even the 20th century with all of its horrors wasn't as bad as, say, like, the big wars in, uh, like, Persia and Greece a couple thousand but years ago. But surely we had more people to kill. That's true. Probably in terms of percentage of population, it was it was different rather right. than absolute ah. numbers. That, that is the point that uh, Stephen Pinker makes in The Angels of Our Better Nature, uh, that your odds of dying as a civilian now are so much lower than they used to be. So even even how even how much it sucked, you're you're still better off, uh, you know, for your risk of dying from well, it turns out just about everything, but especially uh, being killed in, by in a war or as collateral damage. Did you guys ever see Doctor Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb? I sure did. I That's... sure didn't. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, it's great, but one of the major conceits of it is that the the Soviets are creating a dead drop uh, weapon that if a nuclear explosion is detected anywhere on Earth, they launch all their nukes at the U.S. And yeah, it is doomsday. fully... 
Yeah, it's fully automated. They cannot control it. And it is literally throwing your steering wheel out the window. And apparently there were plans to actually implement something like this that they never quite got around to during the Cold War. That's a relief because, I mean, it's only going to a matter of time before North Korea decides to test its new nuclear weapons. And if all of a sudden all of Russia is launching us because of that, that would hardly be a an amicable situation. They're I don't always think... testing, air quotes, by the way, they're always testing their nuclear weapons in North Korea. Yeah. I think it was specifically if if there was a nuclear explosion detected in Russia. I don't I don't remember the details, but in any case, they decided to still keep some humans in the loop rather than to make it completely automated. That's a relief. Yeah. But and then my teachers would say, but there's also evidence that that's not the case. Okay. And kind of ended at that. Okay. <laughs> I'm also curious where people are giving these answers from. I imagine different parts of the world might teach it differently. So mm. depending on our international audience, I'd be particularly interested in hearing from them. Yeah. Uh, on a side note really quick, there was a great, it was in one of the uh, uh, Scott Alexander posts where he talks about a game that was on TV where they played Prisoner's Dilemmas, and it was over like uh, briefcases of cash. Did either of you guys read that? Yes, yes, the I golden balls. I was looking for that, but I couldn't find it because the guy at the end... <laughs> The guy it's not had, what it sounds like. The guy at the end had the perfect strategy. Yes, we have to show these people. Oh, we have to put a link up to the Golden Balls on what? our site. What was the perfect strategy? So it, it is a game show that literally is the prisoner's dilemma at the end. Yeah. You, the two people have amassed a lot of money throughout this game show, and then at the end, you both get two balls that are painted gold. That's the Golden Balls. Uh huh. Inside, they're opaque. You can't see inside them. Inside one of them, it says split, and in the other one, it says steal. Mm hmm. If you, if both players play split, they split the money evenly between them. If one player plays steal and the other player plays split, the person who played steal gets all the money, the person who played split gets nothing. If both players play steal, they forfeit everything, they both go home broke. Yeah, and, and so in all previous uh, episodes, it had come down to people saying, no, dude, I'm totally going to split. I'm going to split, man. Don't uh -huh. worry about me. I'm going to split. We just split. We're going to split. And going back and forth like that for like three minutes, uh -huh. then they finally play the balls, and then you see, did they both split and, you know, and... and do they share the money, or did one person steal, or did they both steal? You know, that's where all the drama comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, in this strategy, the guy goes, Dude, I want you to know I am a man of my word. I would never go back on my word. This is the most important thing to me, so I'm going to steal. And he was like, What? He's like, No, I'm going to steal. You should split. After the show, I'll give you half the money, but I'm going to steal. And he's like, This is stupid. If you're going to split the money anyway, just play the split ball. The guy's like, No. I don't, I'm not going to do that. I don't roll that way. I don't trust you. I'm going to play steel, and after the show, I'll split the money with you. And there uh, was... Yeah. Just, did it work? It did. The other guy played split, and the guy who said he was going to play steel played split as well. Yeah. And because, then they, then from, they split the from, money from the right other there. person's point of view, what I had heard is that the guy had already played his... Whatever, he had touched his golden ball. He'd no, already, I don't think he had. Oh, well, oh, maybe he hadn't. I thought maybe you, maybe he had to play at the same time, but the point was he had pre-committed to saying, look, I'm stealing. Mm -hmm. You're guaranteed to get nothing if you try and change the outcome. Right. But, so... You can say, well, I don't really trust you, but that's already fine. I already stole. Okay, no, so they, if, they have not played the balls yet. Oh, yeah. So he's like, if you if you want, or, but I, I mean, I've already pre-committed to stealing, so yeah, long yeah, as yeah, purposes, yeah. I've already stolen. Yeah. So if you want a probability of getting anything, you just have to split. Right. Whether or not I defect on my word about splitting it with you after the game doesn't really matter. I'm already, I've already pre-committed to, to, to stealing. Exactly. So yeah. this, yeah. this brings Works to mind, out. yeah. yeah. There's a, a TV show that I've been watching a bit of called uh, Cutthroat Kitchen, mm. where, where they where they spend money to screw each other playing some kitchen cooking game. Right. But it's kind of funny, and I've always there hasn't been a player who's who's played any games like this yet. And I don't know if they can exchange money between players. It's not expressly prohibited in the in the quick rules that they give to the audience, but mm -hmm. uh, it would seem to make a lot of sense to me. Someone buys some crazy sabotage for somebody, they're going to give it to me. They bought it for two thousand dollars. Hey, I'll give you a thousand dollars to give it to that person. Right. You get half your money back. I don't get it. They would, you know. But no, one, no one's done that yet, but I think it's, it'd be kind it's of It's got to be against the rules. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Or people Wheeling just might dealing. not be that smart. People might it's just true. be playing it, yeah. So, do we want to talk about the, um, probably, in my opinion, one of the most interesting games, and the one that takes this pre-commitment thing to a weird place? I think we have to. Okay. We're talking about Newcomb's Problem. Okay. You've heard of Newcomb's Problem? Boxes? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Who wants to set it up? Go ahead. Very well. Do it. All right. So, Omega... Flies down out of the sky. Pause. Yes. Who's Omega? Omega is the perfect predictor and who has a lot of money at their disposal because they want to go around and make uh, play this game with humans. Omega may or may not be human. We can't tell. But we do know Omega's really good at predicting shit. 
Yeah. However, Omega... Maybe not necessarily perfect, but really good. Yeah. And we, we have reason to believe that. Right. However, Omega is not God. It does not have supernatural powers. Omega is like Data from Star Trek. He's really <laughs> freaking smart, but if he's not in the room, he can't magically affect things that aren't in the room. Mm -hmm. So, Omega comes up, looks at you for a bit, does a brain scan or something. He's like, okay, I've predicted what you're going to answer when I ask you this question. Then he fiddles with two boxes, presents you with the boxes. One of them is clear. One of them is opaque. In the clear box, box you see $10,000. And Omega says to you, you can now choose to open only the clear box, only the opaque box, sorry, or you can choose to open both the boxes. And then he leaves. And he's left a note that says, if I, <laughs> if I have predicted that you will open both boxes, the opaque box is empty. If I have predicted that you will only open the opaque box, then the opaque box has a million dollars in it. At this point, he cannot change what's in the box anymore, and you have not yet made your decision. Mm -hmm. The opaque box either has a million dollars or doesn't, and the question is, are you going to open both boxes or only the opaque box? So, so you've gotten additional information here. Okay. And the additional information you have is that Omega is fantastic at predicting these things. Yes. So... He's been right 9,000 times out of the past 9,000 and more. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I would say that um, given that he's really awesome at predicting things, you should only open the opaque box. Okay. That's, that's to me, that seems like the only answer. I want the million dollars. But yeah. th is there a Stimman case for taking both boxes? I want the million and 10,000? Well, the, the case is that he can't change what's in the boxes. But he's predicted what you'll do yeah, with, it, with, with, with very good accuracy. So that, that to me is kind of like, I'll, I'm not going to even try and hedge my bets on outwitting the predictor. I'll just take the million. I... I personally agree with you, but I think you said we know someone who would take both boxes. Do we? Did Patrick? Not, yeah, did not Patrick say that? No. Mm. Wait, who? which Patrick? I... Shapen? I assume Shapen. Do we know another Patrick? No. Okay. And also no. Oh no, he would just take the one? Yeah, also okay. I think that the only reason that there's a difference there is because um, he sets up the problem differently. Oh, how does he set it up? I don't know, but in a way that trusting the um, additional information that Omega is very good at predicting things mm -hmm. would result in getting a better thing from the two boxes. Yeah, Patrick right. and I were talking about this last month, and it was about. Uh, Ooh, well, do do the his setup if his setup is better. Well, it wasn't actually I like this one. I like this one better because it's more clear cut. His was okay. more uh, tenuous on how much you can trust uh, Omega's predictive prowess. Okay, um, and that that makes sense, or or I guess by what method Omega makes the prediction. Um, you know, maybe, I can't remember what his setup was, but, I mean, there are other standard setups that I've read about where, like, say... But you don't um, have to know. You don't have to know all you have. You can just have the evidence that Omega's fantastic at making predictions. Mm -hmm. You don't have to know how. Well, and and he knows that, too. I don't want to... Oh, no. Let's not put words in his mouth or no, anything. No, no, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm, I'm kind of diverging from what he said, because I can't remember exactly what it was. I just remember that when he and I were talking about it, one boxing the Newcomb problem was much less obvious. But it seems to me that uh, depending on how much you trust Omega's predictive powers and uh, really, I guess that's it. Well, uh, I mean, either Omega got it right or he got it wrong. The box is already in front of you. Right. Uh -huh. So if he got it right, you might as well open both boxes and get the million dollars and the 10000 extra. But like in an absurd way to put it, like if Omega's strategy is like flipping a coin. Yeah, that's true. So I... Uh, I mean, if they got it, I don't know. It, I, I, I like. I and, like I, and if he get it, if he got it wrong, then you open your one opaque box and there's nothing in it, and you're like, "Fuck, you got it wrong." But if your odds of that are like say one in two because Omega sucks at predicting, yeah. or they're one in a hundred thousand because Omega's great at it, yeah. I'd rather take the, you know, the much better chance of getting the million dollars. Right, mm -hmm. but if your if your predictor is just flipping a coin, then you take both boxes. Right. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. So, but the difference is the amount of information that you have going into it. There's one more thing that I wanted to cover. Do that's it. That's okay. Yes, please. The coordination problem. Mm, yeah. So if there's a lot of different things, um, Scott mentioned uh, a game show where people had to figure out, like, to win, two different people would be dropped in New York and they had to actually choose where to meet up and show up at the same place. I don't think this is game theory, but this is also a thing that we should cover at some point, so we might as well do it now. Well, it's it's kind of game theory. Okay. Or it was certainly covered in the game theory sequence. Okay. Because there are a lot of situations, there are a lot of places where they could both meet mm -hmm. and they would be successful. They wouldn't regret that choice at all and they wouldn't change their answer 
given that the other person chose that. Well, the fascinating so that's thing the, is... Th- those are all Nash equilibria. The fascinating thing is the only thing they are told is you have to meet a person in New York tomorrow. Yeah. And, uh, like, that's it. And and I think it was, like, half the people or so managed to do it anyway. Because when By you think showing of, up at the Empire State Building at noon. Right. Yeah. Or, or Grand Central Station. If you think of New York, those are, like, the two places where you meet people, right? Mm-hmm. And noon is just kind of the time that it that sticks out in the day. Mm-hmm. And you're like, well, sure, let's try that. And, and it manages to work. Yeah. And, and it was the, the guy that uh, the guy that came up with that is Thomas Schelling, which is why those are called Schelling points, places that people naturally converge to. Yeah. I was at the post right. office. Why does that come to mind when I think oh, of Schelling points? Maybe if you're thinking of very small towns? Maybe. For some reason, I, seem, I have this... My node with Schelling point immediately jumps to post office in my brain, and I'm not <laughs> sure why. I'll see if I can Google those terms together if anything comes up. It reminded me of another insect example. Okay. And um, and the reason that shelling points came up, I think, is also when we're talking about cooperating or defecting or, you know, there are evolutionary things that people that people are kind of programmed to do mm-hmm. to help them coordinate yeah. um, for all sorts of different games. Right. And that applies to animals also. Mm-hmm. For example, butterflies. Okay. A lot of butterflies are known as hilltoppers. All right. Do you know why that is? They go to the top of the hill? Yeah. Why do you think they go to the top of the hill? That's where other butterflies are? That's right. All right! <laughs> <laughs> um, finding mates, especially if you're very quiet and maybe there aren't that many of you, is, and you want to find mates that aren't your brood sisters and brothers, right? Um, that also hatched at the same time as you, because you don't want inbreeding. Um, it's a problem in the animal kingdom. And animals have different ways to deal with that. Some of them have like flashing light signals if they are anglerfish, for example, mm-hmm. or pheromones, or there's all sorts of different things that they can do. But if you're a butterfly, you don't got any of those. Well, it depends. Oh, okay. But if you're um, a lame butterfly, so... you don't have any of those. <laughs> but you're cool enough to know that the other butterflies are all going to go to a meeting point, and that meeting point is at the top of the hill, mm-hmm. and that's where you can find a butterfly to meet with and increase your fitness. Cool. Yeah. And therefore leave the trait of going to the top of the hill to your offspring. Yeah. Actually, to kind of bring that towards humans, because I know that you're interested in bringing that towards humans, um, you know those little midges that swarm together? They're a bunch of swarming flies if you're maybe out on a soccer field or at a park. Well, one of the reasons they swarm around your head is because you are locally the tallest thing. Hmm. And they're finding other midges to mate with. Oh. Now, I, now I'm less annoyed at them all of a sudden. Just <laughs> like, yes. I'm because, supporting because sex li- orgy. Because or midge orgy. Literally every time I walk through a cloud of them, I'm thinking, you have the entire, like not the entire sky, you can only go so high. Right, right. But you have literally everything around, you know. It's like birds that fly right in front of my car. Uh-huh. You have the, exactly, you have the whole sky. Why are, why are you right in my face? But now I get it. Now I can sympathize in a little yeah, better. Yeah, they're very responsive to even small changes in topography to find other flies. So in order to avoid a a, a horde, what do you call it? A, a, a gaggle? A mix? A, <laughs> a swarm? A brood? A, uh, a swarm, that's the word I was looking for. Um, of midges, you could say, carry an umbrella, but rather than try and fend them off with it, you'd hold it above your head? Yeah, so, I mean, that's what I thought. Um, in practice, I've tried that, or also getting next to somebody who's tall and then crouching down. Okay. And I think it works to a certain extent. Get a small person, put them on your shoulders. I think that once you're kind of in that situation, they kind of, hmm. once once they find the tall thing, they okay. also go out to the sides and just kind of around. Hmm. And um, so you want to just start being short and continue being <laughs> short. In really, that situation next to a tall person potentially. Or... Your your best weapon is um what is that bug spray DDT? Well, no, yeah. not DDT. Just spray that Deet. everywhere you go. Deet. Deet. Okay, right. DDT is very different. Okay. Kind of pesticide. Ah. I think we should wrap it up. I think so too. I think we've gone over. Actually, I'm a little disappointed that the newcomers thing. I was hoping we knew someone who uh, who would one box on Julie it. Julie Galef is what you claimed before. Julie Galef, I mentioned she went on a date with someone tried to nuke him box her for like that she they set up a nuke him box thing for her for fun i can't remember if she said she one box or two box or not yeah mm. i'm super skeptical at this point now that i've had that conversation with patrick people say that they one box or two box that they actually are just coming from a different set of 
presuppositions, right? Okay. It's a different, different set of priors. Yeah. So. I think they'd have to in order to one box. Uh, or excuse me, to two, two box. box. Right. Because it, the answer's so cut and dry. But I'll, I'll look into it. I'm sure there's some good mm-hmm. reason not oh, to. I'm sure there is. I think I that know if a you lot are... of classical, I don't know if it was classical economists or classical theorists, some groups uh, said very strongly, you should two box because uh, Omega cannot change their decision anymore. So what, you should go in, she go in pretending that you would only open one box and you dress then... Like a, you dress like a one boxer? I don't yeah, know. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that, that's, kind of, that, that's what makes it somewhat relevant to me, how, how Omega comes with a decision. Uh-huh. Because if it's like, say, a brain scan when you enter, well, you can try and change your state of mind or something, mm-hmm. or, you know, whatever it is. But if it's just some alien magic power and they're like, I'm pretty positive you're going to do this, well... I don't know how to trump that by just sitting there thinking about it. So, yeah. yeah, you don't really have the resources. I don't know. You could always try making the stakes higher. I remember, um, I remember the prisoners, the true prisoners dilemma post where, uh, where Ellie Eiser compared paper clips versus saving a million people's lives. Maybe it could be like you have a bunch of sick, sick friends that are going to die, and they'll pick boxes one pill that you will cure one of them. Oh. And well, in the clear box is one pill that will cure one of them, and in the uh. And the opaque box is either zero or ten pills. Or five. Or zero or five, yeah. So and so all of a so sudden, if you get both of them, then all your friends will survive. Yes. But if you only pick the opaque box, then five. This episode is a bit more of a of a primer on some of the terms in game theory and not so much a now you're a game theory expert. No. Um, yeah. Not at all. But just just this way people will know what mean what we mean when we say one boxing or cooperating and defecting. Right. I feel like I know more about game theory having been prepared for this episode. Same. So we'll we'll compare that benefit to you by linking to basically everything we read to uh, prepare for this episode. So Awesome. I think we did okay. I think we did too. So stay tuned for listener feedback, which we will get into now. Now is the part where we do listener feedback, starting with a comment from uh, Condition of Man, who says that the Uniform Code of Military Justice, Article 134, Paragraph 62, still prohibits adultery, uh, in response to us saying that polyamory was not illegal in the United States. Was that poly episode 10? Uh, either 9 or 10, one of them. Okay. Yeah. And 9 and 10. 9 and 10, I guess both of them together, yeah. The, I, I looked into it, and it's really vague. It's more of a, a conduct unbecoming if it causes distress in the military or brings disrespect upon the military. So when they actually enforce it, it is very much uh, up to the courts. I guess that's why half the army has not been kicked out of the army yet. <laughs> hey, you know, you go overseas for a year. What do you expect is going to happen? Um, but... But it is technically in there, so they could drum you out for being poly, even if it doesn't bring any drama into the military or any disrespect on it, as long as some judge says that he doesn't like you or he doesn't like what you're doing. Well, that's too bad. Yeah. There's a lot of weird stuff around marriage in the military. Yeah. I know somebody who married into the military specifically to get a financial gain. Yes, same here. Yeah. Um, I think everyone who knows people in the military knows that, or someone <laughs> like that. I know one person in my age range who's in the military, and he, he got married for love. Okay. But the fact that they're each getting like a bonus thousand a month was, you know, there. And so. upgraded housing. Yeah. I, I've heard once mm-hmm. you're married, you get your own little special area. Instead of having to share a bunk with, you know, seven other dudes. That sounds like a sweet deal. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of incentive in the military to get married. If I ever fall in hard times. I think... <laughs> <laughs> Marry someone in the military. Right. <laughs> uh, would you like to read the top one? This is for our voting episode, which just came out. Ah, yes. I'm surprised there was no talk of Brexit, but maybe this was recorded before that all went down. If more rational-minded people in the UK voted last week, it would have been a different story. I don't have much of a comment there. Um, Did I say the commenter's name, Eddie Flash? You did not, but now you have. Now I have. That was for episode 11? Yeah. And that was, we do record generally three to four weeks before they go on air, so that was definitely before the Brexit was in the news. Mm Mm-hmm. But I'm interested, I would have been interested to hear about what our guest thought about that. I know personally, I I don't know what he felt about the voting, Mm -hmm. but I do know that he was very disappointed with the results. I expect, based on how many people right now are having breg regret, or whatever they're calling it, regret, (laughs) (laughs) that uh, maybe, to his point, if people who were less informed would have stayed home, this might not have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think I that was think... one of Tim's things. If you aren't very informed on the subject, just don't vote. Yeah, I I don't think that this disproves his point yeah. in any way. 
that's interesting. I don't have much to say. I I just like the. I mean, I'm sure that there's a whole big world collapse over this, but for me, it's just kind of fun to watch. <laughs> kind, of, kind of kind of that perverse part of me that wants Trump to win the election. Right, right. I just like seeing what happens. Burn it all down. <laughs> bring raise it up again from the ashes. Burn to the ground. Yeah. Another uh, comment on the voting episode is from Jess. Jess said. I love this podcast and all the work you put into the relevant links and follow-up. Smiley face. Keep up the ex- excellent work, guys. Thanks, Jess. You rock. Woo! Thank you. Yay. What else we got? Uh, do you want to read this one from Peter? Sure. Okay. Um, this is regarding the polyamory episode 9 and 10. If there's any chance at all that adding secondary partners would devalue the bond with my primary partner, it's just not worth it. The costs are too deep and the benefits too shallow. Uh, They go on to say, I'm not defending the strong claim, adding secondary partners weakens your primary bond. I'm defending the weaker claim. If there's any chance adding secondary partners will weaken my primary bond, it's not worth it. So my answer is, there are a lot of things that could have a chance of weakening your bond with your primary partner. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, things as uh, common as getting a new job or a promotion. Um, things like eating a different kind of ice cream. I don't know. It's There's a lot of different things that you could do. So it's one of those situations where you kind of want to weigh things out. Things like having different taste in music. Yeah. Um, although I guess that's not a thing you would do. No. But maybe like one of you would go to a concert and the other one wouldn't. I, I don't, don't know. know. Yeah. Like bonds, are, bonds are weird that way. Yeah. Um, personally, I it, honestly, it depends in a large way, but... Um, my bond with my, my husband of eight years, um, in most of the situations I think has gotten stronger and stronger, even when I dated people who were not really good partners. Yeah. I, I wanted to say a similar thing (laughs) to that. In my experience, having a secondary partner actually made the bond with my primary much stronger Mm -hmm. because when you only have the one primary partner. The thing you're comparing them person to is the idealized partner, you know, the the person who's perfect in every way and only exists in fantasy. And uh, when you have an actual real person to compare them to, they're better in some ways, but in other ways you're like, oh god, I am I am so glad I don't have to live with this person because I couldn't stand that one little thing. And uh, it, it 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 the grass being greener on the other side. Once you actually go to the other side, you're like, oh no, the grass here's about the same. I like that side where I was on there before, too. Let me tell you <laughs> why it, I felt like it strengthened my bond with um, my partner, mm-hmm. with my existing partner. I'm not going to do the primary, secondary thing. Right. I feel like I got to see him in action being an awesome, supportive, kind human being and sticking with me through thick and thin and reaching out to people and yeah there's just um there was so much awesomeness that came from that so yes i guess there's a chance it can make things weaker but there's also a chance it can make things stronger so it's not just the tiniest chance that it might make it weaker there's also a chance that it could make it stronger instead also you have a team dedicated to dating you i would say (laughs) as far as you know really anything that you're considering that might have an impact on your relationship it's the kind of thing that you should talk about with your current partner and i think there are some people that Polly would weaken the relationship, others that it would strengthen it for. The only person who can really decide that is you and your partner. Uh-huh. And then one final thing, which I hope will be our last thing about the Polly, because we've just gone on for about it so much, but there was a person whose name I'm not sure I'm going to say, but in the second episode, 10, near, I think, the 10-minute mark, I started mentioning some things that might make someone uh, undesirable, I guess, in a hypothetical sense. And they they responded negatively to that, saying, Jesus, I can't believe you just said that, and online as well. Many sexually evicted men are not like the stereotypes you pulled out of your ass at all. And, and I felt bad about that, so I wrote something in reply, and I'm just going to read what I wrote. I just want to interject very quickly that what Anyash said was, if you are a terrible person then you need to up your game. Yes. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, so he's referring to. Yeah. So my, my reply is that I, I apologize for my careless words. Uh, we've been recording for well over an hour and a half at that point, <laughs> and I was getting tired, and I flailed around searching for descriptors that would commonly be associated with people at the very lowest levels of desirability, quote. I did not intend this at all to include all men who are involuntary celibates. I have read both Scott Alexander's and Scott Arison's essays on this, and I sympathize very strongly with them. 
There are many men who are not awful and undesirable, and who still have immense trouble finding a partner for a number of other reasons. I, I meant only to say that the most unlikable people don't do any better under monogamy than they do under polyamory, and trying to force a solution of every woman must be paired with one man so that even the least desirable man is assured a woman does not work, as often people would prefer to stay single rather than the alternative. In addition to not working, it is also reprehensible because it again treats women as objects to satisfy men rather than as self-directed agents. And since a systemic solution is untenable, while a personal solution is viable, if potentially difficult. I was trying to convey that, but my tone was crass, and I'm sorry. Uh, I have one more comment I want to dig up. Do we? Uh, we have exactly one review on iTunes. Do what? we? We do? It's a one-star review. Oh, uh, no! They, they made it 30 seconds into the first episode. Okay. One star. The title is stupid. <laughs> the, the submitter was VU Alumni. I couldn't make it past the one minute mark on this podcast. Within the first 30 seconds, the host refers to you as the listener as not smart enough, and that's why you're still listening to their <laughs> podcast. Oh, shit. What, Dude, I what told would possess you. you to think I... that. <laughs> what would possess you to think that when you are trying to build a fan base, the very best way to do that is by insulting the very people you're courting to patron your podcast? Bum, bum, bum. I, I am the suck. Well. <laughs> Did they not wait until I called you on it? Apparently they did not. Apparently they, they, had their, they had their finger ready on the on the pause button and, and ceased listening immediately. To those of you who are still here, glad you're able to make it past that. It, we don't think you're stupid, or no. that we're stupid. Well, we just think that we're crazy. Stupid. Yeah. We're, we're, we, were, we were freestyling in the first episode, you know, so here we are now. That said, this is our friendly reminder to uh, please go on and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Give us some reviews and ratings on iTunes if you think the podcast is worth 30 seconds of your time to do so. Yeah. Even if you think we're worth two stars, it'll increase our average rating. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys. No, you're good. It's okay. Okay, this has been the Basin Conspiracy. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. See you, see you in a couple weeks. Yeah.